Resourceful Designer, episode 133, 12 Red Flags for Spotting Bad Design Clients. Welcome to the Resourceful Designer Podcast, offering solutions to streamline your graphic and web design business so you can get back to designing. And now, your host. His spot on the couch is the same as Sheldon Cooper's, although he's not as protective of it. Mark Decote. Welcome to the podcast. My name is Mark Decote, your host, and I want to thank you for tuning in to this episode where I discuss bad clients and how to spot them. Now, this is the first of a two-parter I'm doing. This week, I'm going to be talking about spotting bad clients. And in part two, next week, I'm going to go over how to properly turn away clients so as not to offend them or burn bridges because what somebody might look like a bad client now doesn't necessarily mean they'll be a bad client in the future. So be sure to tune in to next week's episode as well. Now, in this week, I'll also share a tip of the week this week, not a resource, but a tip of the week that hopefully will help you avoid the experience that I had, a major problem that I had earlier this week. And my tip will hopefully help you to avoid going through the same thing I did. Now, it's been a busy week for me. I was off for the past two weeks. My wife and I decided to take holidays. We didn't really do anything or go anywhere, but I just took some time off work. I did cheat a little bit and come in and do a few little jobs late at night after she had fallen asleep on the couch or something like that. But I didn't start anything new and I didn't keep up with my emails or anything. So this week was a lot of playing catch up after two weeks, replying to voicemails, replying to emails and all of that. But the worst part of it is the last day of our holidays on the Sunday, I was out in my yard and there's a lot of trees in my yard. And I decided that I wanted to trim some of the trees. We've got some nice cedar hedges and there was a few branches that were just blocking them or going through them. So I decided I'm going to get the pole that I have with a blade at the end to cut uh, branches. And I went and I started cutting a bunch of branches. Well, once I had all these branches everywhere, and when I'm saying branches, I'm talking some big branches from trees. I decided that I might as well start a fire. We're allowed where I live. We can start a fire. I've got a fire pit in the backyard. It says I might as well start a fire and burn these branches instead of just having them piled around. So I started dragging everything back to the fire pit. I started a fire. And as I was dragging, I was throwing stuff onto the fire pit. Well, at one point I went to grab one of the big branches and I felt a pick on my finger. Now, I knew that some of these branches had thorns in them because just the type of trees we have, a couple of the, tr- uh, the trees are thorny trees. So I thought I had actually grabbed one of the thorns. But then when I looked down, I saw that there was a bee hanging from my finger. Well, I shook it off and noticed that there was actually two spots on my hand that I got stung. The, the bee was hanging from one and another spot. There was still a stinger hanging there. And I looked down and there was, a, there was about four or five bees buzzing around that one branch that I had tried to grab. I have no idea why they were there. There was no nests or anything. But to make a long story short, my hand swelled up. I had a, an allergic reaction, a localized allergic, allergic reaction. I'm not necessarily allergic to bees. I didn't go off into uh, anaphylactic shock or anything like that. But my hand did swell up. And I'm recording this on Thursday right now. And this happened on Sunday. And the swelling is finally just starting to go down. So for all this week, and it just so happens, it's my clicking finger for on my mouse. So what a pain. It was sore. It was itchy. And every time I wanted to do something, it was just awkward because my finger was like the size of a sausage. So using the mouse was not fun. But I persevered and got some work done, caught up with all the voicemails and all the emails, and now I'm right back at it. So that's been my week so far. Now, as I mentioned in the intro, I'm not going to share a resource of the week this week. Instead, I'm going to share a tip of the week. And this tip is if you are hosting websites for clients or if you have your own website or a bunch of websites on a shared server or whatever, check with your hosting provider to see if they limit the number of enodes that you're allowed. Now, what's an enode, you ask? It's funny because I asked the same thing when they told me I had bypassed my limit. I guess an enode, and I didn't look up the definition or anything, from what they tell me, an enode is a file. Now, I have my hosting, I pay for unlimited bandwidth and unlimited disk space. So I thought that meant I could put whatever I want on there. But what I didn't know is if you read the fine print, 
my hosting actually says that there is a limit of 200,000 enodes or 200,000 files. So yes, I can have unlimited websites, as many websites as I want, and I could use as much bandwidth as I want, providing I don't go over 200,000 files. And with 30 plus websites on the server for various clients that I have, at some point, it was bound to happen. Now, what happened to me is I was actually working, this was on uh, the Sunday, the same day I got stung later that night, I was working on one of my websites. It's uh, a, an affiliate site I created a couple of years ago. It, it's not really a good site. It doesn't do much for me. I probably make about $10 a month off this site. But it, I went in there just to see if there was any updates because I hadn't looked at the site in a while. And of course, there was a bunch of plugins that needed updating. And I started clicking to update the plugins. It's not one of the sites that I have hooked up through my sync that uh, where all my client sites are. As I said, this is a site I did a few years ago, and I just ignore it most of the time. So I was in there updating, and I updated a plugin, and then I updated the next plugin. Then when I went to update the third plugin, it told me that it was unable to update. It was There was an error, and it says it couldn't create the directory or couldn't create the file or whatever. I forget the exact error message, and it couldn't do it. I says, huh, that's weird. So I tried to update it again. It still didn't work. So I tried the next plugin. And it worked. So I said, okay, well, there must be something wrong with that plugin. So I went down the line because there was about eight or nine of them that needed updating. I clicked on another plugin and I got the same error. Then I clicked on another one and I got the same error. And at that point forth, there was nothing I could do. I couldn't update any of the plugins. Now, I didn't know what was going on. So I closed the website down. I says, oh, maybe I'll just close. I'll, I'll re-log in, see if that does anything. I don't know why it would, but no, it didn't, it wouldn't work. So I was fiddling around trying to figure out what was going on. So I decided to try a different website and see if I had a similar problem there. So I launched up another website, one of my clients' website that just so happened to have a plugin or two that needed updating. And sure enough, I clicked and they couldn't update as well, including the theme that needed updating. Nothing could update. Everything was saying it couldn't update the directory or it couldn't update the file or whatever. And after trying a couple of different sites and everything, every site, nothing would work. I finally decided to contact the hosting company that I use and said, listen, I'm having some issues here. None of my sites, can I update anything? What's the problem? And that's when they got back to me and they said, oh, you've gone over your enode limit. And of course, not knowing what that was, I says, uh, could you please explain that further? What does that mean? So they explained, sure, enode. And they told me that an enode is basically a file. I don't know why they call them enodes and not files. But they told me that I had a 200,000 file limit. And they what they did is they sent me, says, here's the terms of agreement to the thing that whenever I signed up the hosting and sure enough on one of them it says that I cannot exceed 200,000 enodes and I had gone over it so their suggestion was either buy a second hosting package and migrate some of the websites over to it or delete some stuff from the current one now luckily I had a couple of client websites that the clients went out of business and they, their websites were no longer live but I still had them on the server for some reason. I'd never deleted them. So I went through and deleted a couple of those and that, and it ended up bringing me below the limit. So things started working again. So I did free up some space, but it looks like I'm going to have to buy some more hosting. And it's not that big a deal. Hosting's not that expensive. So I'll just purchase another hosting package and from now on build everything on that new one. But all that just to let you know that if you're not aware of it, because I know I wasn't, I've been doing this for years and years and I've never ran into this problem before. Check with your hosting provider to see if there is a limit to the number of enodes you can use. And that's I-N-O-D-E, enode or inode. I don't know how you pronounce it. Because luckily, it, nothing happened to any of my clients. Actually, I did have one client that told me they were trying to upload some, uh, they, they're running an e-commerce site that I built for them. And they were uploading some products. And they sent me an email saying, Mark, uh, for some reason, it won't let us upload any more images to our image gallery before the products. But that's the only client I know that it affected. And once I uh, deleted and I freed up some space, they were able to start uploading again. So that's my tip of the week this week is check to see if there is an enode limit for your hosting and find out how you can check how close you are to it or what your options are. Because you don't want to go through that, especially during a busy week, whenever there's lots of client stuff to do. You don't want to be stuck in the middle of trying to figure out how you can free some space off a server in order to get things working again. So. That's my tip of the week this week. And now, 12 red flags for spotting bad design clients. Now, just a few episodes ago, episode 129, I shared nine reasons to pass on design projects. Now, that episode was dealing more with 
an existing client who brings a project to you that you're not interested in doing. So if you haven't checked out that episode, you can get to it at resourcefuldesigner.com slash episode 129. Now, even further back, way back in episode 42, I did kind of touch on this topic in the episode titled, It's Okay to Say No to Design Work. But that one dealt more with the projects. If a client brings a project to you that you really don't want to work in, and it's new clients, but they're coming to you to do a project, like something that happened to me this week. Somebody contacted me after they had seen some signs I had designed for somebody else. And they says, oh, we'd love you to, to design a sign for us. And when I said, great, what sort of sign? And they said, well, we're selling our farm and we need a sign at the front that just says it's for sale. And I told them, I says, well, thank you very much for thinking of me, but really you can just go to the sign company and have them do that. There's no sense paying my fee to design a sign for that. It, they didn't need anything fancy. They just wanted wording that said for sale and contact information. So that's the type of job that it's okay to say no to. And that episode, if you're interested, is at resourcefuldesigner.com slash episode 42. Today, what I want to talk about is the clients themselves, specifically clients that you may want to avoid working with. Now, maybe you're just starting out in this industry. Maybe you're struggling. You're one of the struggling artists, struggling designers out there, and you're having a hard time making ends meet. And the thought of turning away clients is completely foreign to you. Not to mention that telling clients that you can't or won't help them is not only an uncomfortable thing to do, it kind of goes against our very nature to want to help people. We are people pleasers. Human beings are people pleasers by nature, or at least most people are. And when somebody comes to you for help, it's very uncomfortable to say, no, you can't or you won't help them. Plus, there's always the fear that turning a client away may actually backfire on you and you could lose some future opportunities with that client. Now, all of those are real fears. They're really something that you feel and there is a very big possibility that all of them come true. But in order to not only run a successful design business, but to also be happy in the work that you're doing, to enjoy the designs you're working on, there will be times when passing on a client is the right thing to do. Trust me, not every client out there is right for you. And there are some that you just plain don't want to work with. In the 13 years I've been running my business, I have worked with a few clients that I really wish I had turned away at the start. But I had ignored some red flags and decided to work with them, much to my regret. You see, being selective in your client selection is not only helping yourself, but you're also helping the client because no matter who they are, they do deserve to work with someone who's better suited to serve them if that person is not you. So how do you know when you should pass on a client and what red flags to look for? Well, before you decide whether or not to work with a client, you really need to try to get a feel for what working with that client would be like. Only then will you know if you want to invest the time building a relationship with them. So start off by asking them about themselves and their business before taking on any project. Get to know the client first. When they call you up or they send you an email, ask them about their business. Ask them about them, their motives, their, their desires. This is a little bit part of the discovery process, but it's also a good way to get to know the client. So you get to find out a little bit about them and their business before talking about whatever project it is they want you to do. Then, once you do move on to discussing the project, make sure to ask them what it is they expect from you as a designer. Now, I'm not talking about the deliverables. I'm not talking about the website you're going to build, or I'm not talking about the logo you're going to design, or the brochures, or the trade show booth, or whatever it is. I'm talking about what they expect to get from working with you. Now, through this initial conversation, you should start to get a small feel for what it would be like working with this client. And once you've done this over and over and you've been working for a while, you will develop the ability to feel out a client and decide at that get-go whether or not there's somebody you want to work with. Now, one trick is I suggest you never agree to a project on the initial call or meeting. If they call you up and they want you to work on something, your instinct, if it sounds like a great project, is say, yes, okay, let's do this. I suggest you never agree to a project. What you do is say, okay, let me send you a proposal, even for the simplest things. And in that case, it's more to put stuff in writing. You say, okay, give me your email address. I'm going to send you a proposal about everything we just talked about. 
uh, if to look over. And if everything's great, then we can move forward. But don't agree to the job yet. Just tell them you're sending the proposal for them to go over. Now, this will accomplish two things. One, it'll give you more time to think about the client and to research them if needed. And two, should you not spot any of the red flags that I'm going to talk about in a minute and you decide to move forward with the client and they turn out to be a bad client, at least you have that initial proposal in writing, everything you talked about in writing, so you can fall back if there's any dispute. Yes, you need to have a contract, but that initial discussion is very important to have in writing. So that's one of the reasons why every time there's a project, no matter how small it is, I suggest you don't say yes right away. Tell them that you're very interested. You would love to work on it. Let me send you a proposal, and then we can see if, there, if we can come to an agreement. And sometimes that little extra time is all you need to decide whether the client is right for you. But what sort of red flags should you be looking out for? Well, I have 12 of them I'm going to go over here right now. So red flag number one is, does the client have a bad reputation? Now, you might not be familiar with this client that calls you up. You might have never heard them before. They found you through, I don't know, maybe they did a Google search or something, and you have no idea who they are. But that doesn't mean you can't research them. After telling them, it's like, let me send you a proposal, and then you hang up with them. Do a Google search. Look for their company name. Look for their name and see what sort of information comes up that may help you make a decision. Are there any news articles about them? Have they been in trouble for something? Are there any better business reports that come up? Those are all things that can help you make a decision. If for some reason during the conversation, they start mentioning either a supplier or somebody that you may know or or get a name of somebody, there's nothing wrong with contacting that person or that company and ask them how this client was to work with. Sometimes that's the best thing to do. You can contact somebody and say, how is this client? Were they a good people to work with? And some people, if, if they weren't, most people would be honest with you. Nobody's going to say, oh, I hated working with that client, but tell you, oh yeah, they're great. I mean, something similar happened to me not that long ago. A client or a potential client called me up and asked me if I can quote on a job for them. And I thought this a little strange because I knew that there was another designer. This was a local client. I knew there was another local designer that had been working with this client for years, had done all this client's previous stuff. So why was this client contacting me now to do something for them? So after the initial call and I I told them I'd write up a proposal for them, I immediately called up this other designer and I asked them, I says, um, I just got a weird phone call from so-and-so. I thought you did all the work for them. And the first words that came out of that designer's uh, mouth were, run away now. And they told me all the problems they've had with that client over the years. And finally, they built up the courage to tell that client they didn't want to work with them anymore. And some of the stuff that that designer told me was enough for, to convince me that I didn't want to work with that client either. So I sent a... a email back to that client afterwards saying, thank you very much for contacting me, but I've decided that I'm not going to work on this job. So red flag number one, does the client have a bad reputation? If they do, then you might not want to work with them. Now, red flag number two is inconsistent communication. These are the type of clients who will contact you saying, oh, we're in a big rush. We really have something uh, that we need it done right away. And you say, okay, okay, let's get everything rolling. And then you wait and they're not sending you anything. They're not sending you the stuff that they said was so important that you need to get the job started. Or they ask you for a proposal. We need a quote. We need a quote, super rush. You know, can you get it to us by the end of the day? It's, it's really important. And you work really hard. You get a quote or a proposal out to them and then crickets. You don't hear from them. You send them an email asking them if everything was okay and they don't reply to your email. And it might be weeks or months later when finally they get back to you. Well, inconsistent communication is a big red flag on how working with this client will be on a real project. If they can't communicate consistently with you in the initial parts, whenever you're first talking to them, you're first going over the project, you're, you're sending out your contract and all this stuff. If there's difficulty communicating them with them at that stage, chances are the project is going to be even worse. So that is a good red flag that if you spot that early, it can save you a lot of headaches from working with this client. Now, red flag number three is a client that rudely challenges your fees, your proposal, your contract. And I know it's normal for a client to question your price, as long as they do it in a professional manner. 
if they look at the price and they say, whew, you know, that's more than we were expecting. Our budget was closer to this amount and not that amount. You know, is there anything we can do about this? Or, well, I don't know if we're going to be able to do this. You know, that's a little bit more expensive than we thought. Well, that's the sort of thing that you expect from a client. And some clients will just say, no, we can't do it. And they move along. But it's when a client rudely challenges your fee and kind of scoffs at your prices and will reply with something like, ah, who do you think you are? You're working from home. Why are you charging so much? Or come on, you can do better than that. You don't even have any overhead. You know, that sort of reply. If they're already talking to you like that, at that spot, they haven't even hired you. We're just talking prices. If the client is rudely challenging your fees, then chances are that they're not going to get any better once you agree to a term and you start working on a project. And if the client does say, oh, your prices are too high and they start threatening to go elsewhere, let them. Chances are they're not a client you want to work with. This sort of thing is akin to bullying. And any client that starts off a relationship like that isn't worth keeping. Now, red flag number four is a client that expects you to be on call 24-7. Some clients may insist on daily progress updates. They want to see a proof at every stage, not just at the end of the design process. Or they want to be able to communicate with you at any and all hours of the day through all sorts of different means. They'll reach out to you on on Facebook, on, on email, on text, whatever, phone calls. Some clients may expect super fast turnarounds from you. They'll contact you in the morning and expect to see a proof that afternoon. Or they expect you to be on call anytime they need you. And they might only contact you every few weeks or every few months. But when they do, they expect you to be right there for them at the drop of a hat whenever they need you. These are the type of clients that will email you, then they'll text you telling you that they just sent you an email, and then follow up with a Facebook message letting you know that they've emailed and texted you. Now, I don't know many designers that would enjoy working for a client like that. And if that's not the way you want to work, then I suggest you do not work with that client. And that's a red flag that if you spot it early, can save you a lot of trouble. If they ask you for a quote, And an hour later, they're emailing you wondering why they haven't got the quote yet. That's a bad sign. Now, red flag number five is a client that wants to micromanage you. Any client that wants to micromanage you doesn't respect your skills and your experience as a designer. They think they know what's best for their business because it's their business and they want you to follow their lead. Remember that working with a client is a partnership. It's not a dictatorship. You are not their employee. You do not work for them. You are working with them. There are few things worse than working with a bossy client. And if you feel at any point that your authority in this possible partnership may be minimized, then pass on that client. Now, red flag number six is a client that doesn't want to partake in your discovery process. The discovery process is what differentiates you from designers on Fiverr, on 99designs, on Upwork, or any of those crowdsourcing places, because they don't have the opportunity to do proper discovery, to find out about the company they're designing for. And that's one of the benefits you have running your own business, is you can find out things about your client, not just about the project they want you to do, but you can discover things about the client that can help you design something for them. And some clients think that the discovery process is a complete waste of time. After all, you're the designer. Just go ahead and design something nice. Why do you need to know all these things about them and their business? Well, without proper discovery to learn about your clients, there's no way to design the perfect piece to solve their problem. Now, you know that design means you're solving a problem. I discussed this in episode 84 of the podcast, resourcefuldesigner.com slash episode 84. You're more than a designer, you're a problem solver. If a client refuses to partake in discovery, there's a good chance that you will fail to please them with your work since there's no way for you to know exactly what problem it is you're trying to solve with your design. Every design solves a problem, whether it's a logo, whether it's a car wrap, whether it's a trade show booth, whether it's a billboard, whether it's a website, whether it's a banner ad, every design solves a problem. And if you don't know what that problem is, and you discover those problems through discovery, if you don't know what the problem is, there's no way for you to design the perfect solution for it. So if a client doesn't want to partake in your discovery process, 
that's a good red flag to say this is not a client you should be working with because they won't respect what you do. Now, red flag number seven is a client that wants you to steal or copy another designer's work. Now, I don't think there's really a need for an explanation to this red flag. If a client asks you to copy something outright or to make something look very similar to something another designer did, maybe just change the the wording so it's their company name and maybe change the color or, or something, then there's only two things you can really do. One, you can educate the client on why you cannot do what they're asking of you because of ethical reasons, copyright laws, and so forth, and let them know that they're hiring you to design something unique that will represent them in the best possible way. And maybe instead of copying a design, that they should use them as inspiration instead. You should try to educate your client on all of that. And if they don't listen, then number two, walk away. Those are the only two options at this juncture. Educate them on why you shouldn't be copying that sort of thing. And if they don't agree with you, walk away. Now, red flag number eight is when a client complains about previous designers that they've worked with. There is no good that can come from working with a client that starts off their relationship with you by complaining about previous designers they've worked with. Whether they're telling you that, oh, you know, I had this other designer and he just didn't get me or he didn't understand our business, didn't understand how to do uh, stuff or, or whatever he tells you. Or we just didn't get along or he kept trying to do stuff that, you know, I didn't like. And whatever it is, 95% of the time, there was probably nothing wrong with the previous designer. It was the client that was the problem. Now, do you want to really take the chance, take that risk that you fill that 5% and be the designer, the savior that this client is looking for? Because that's a very small bit for you to fill. If you fail to meet up to the standards that this client is looking for, like previous designers have failed before you, then all you accomplish is having this client bashing your name and your reputation along with those other designers as well. So when a client starts off a conversation telling you about all the trouble they've had with past designers, be very, very leery. I mean, unless the client can provide you and show you, says, here's what the other designer provided me. And if you look at it and you realize that, oh, this other designer really had no idea what they're doing because this is really bad design, then maybe it's okay to work with the client. But if um, without proof, then I would be very leery to work with that client. Now, red flag number nine is when a client doesn't want to sign a contract. Run away, run away fast. Some clients will try anything. You know, go ahead, get the job started. I'll mail the contract out to you tomorrow. Or there's really a tight deadline on this project. Uh, why don't you just get started and then we can worry about the contract afterwards. This red flag, although bad, isn't always the end all of a client relationship. If you firmly but politely tell the client that, sorry, I cannot get started without a signed contract, there's a good chance that they will concede and then you can move forward with the client. However, If the client pushes back and wants to delay signing the contract or refuses for some reason to sign a contract, then just kindly pass on and tell them that you don't work that way and good luck with your future designer. Now, red flag number 10 is when a client wants you to work for free or on spec or for exposure. I mean, in this day and age, I shouldn't have to explain to you why you should be compensated monetarily for your work. Unfortunately, There are people out there who still don't see what you do as a real job. And therefore, since it's not a real job in their eyes, they don't think they need to pay you like a real business person does. If a client wants to work with you in exchange for exposure or because the project will make a great portfolio piece for you or with the promise of referring you to all their vast network of influential business people that they know, Or should the client say, well, why don't you design something, show it to me, and if I like it, I'll buy it from you? If any of those situations occur, it's your duty as a professional designer to inform them that you deserve to be paid for your services. If they can't pay you, then you can't work with them. You are no different than any other service out there that they would hire. They wouldn't think of treating an electrician, a contractor, a plumber, a lawyer, They wouldn't 
think of treating any of them that way, there's no reason for you to be treated that way either. So if they insist, then you walk away. Now, red flag number 11 is when a client just seems creepy or or starts flirting with you. Now, this one can make you feel really uncomfortable. There might be nothing wrong with the client. It's just the way they act. Some people are just natural flirts. They don't even realize they're doing it. But other people actually use flirting as a manipulating tactic to get what they want. And unfortunately, it's not always easy to distinguish between the two. And either way, if the client is constantly flirting, it could leave you feeling very uncomfortable if you're not receptive to the flirting. I met with a client once. There was this woman that wanted me to do some work and we met at a coffee shop. And first thing she did is I was sitting across from her. She picked up her chair and she dragged it over so that we were now sitting almost next to each other. So instead of being across from the table, we were sitting at 90 degree angles to each other. She immediately brought her chair over there. And the first thing she did upon introducing herself was put her hand on my knee. Now, I don't know if she was trying to do this on purpose to manipulate me or if it's just the type of person she was, but I'm a married man and I was feeling uncomfortable with that. Like this woman I just met, it was, it was too overbearing for me. And just the way she was laughing and the way she was talking about the work with me, I I just felt really uncomfortable. And I decided this was not a client I wanted to work with. And this is me, a guy with a woman. She, she was a, a good looking woman doing this to me. I can't imagine how a woman designer would feel if a guy was doing this to them, because I know just throughout history, guys are creeps. And I can't imagine a woman putting up with a male client that would be flirting with them all the time, especially if it was something that the woman didn't want. So be very wary of any client that flirts. Now, there might be nothing wrong with them. And the client may turn out to be the perfect client. And there's always the possibility that you can tell them that you're uncomfortable with the way they're acting and you would like to work with them, but as long as this kind of perceived flirting would stop. But some people are just naturally the way they do it and they might have a hard time. And if their flirting makes you feel uncomfortable, then pass on the client. It's not worth your unease to work with them. And the last red flag I want to talk about, red flag number 12, is simply if you have a bad feeling about a client, it's the type of thing you can't explain. The client comes to you with a great project. You give them your terms and they accept it. You give them a quote and they agree to your price. For all intents and purposes, they seem like the perfect client. And yet, there's just something about them that gives you a bad feeling. Now, I don't want to compare design clients to people in dark vans offering candy to kids to manipulate them or lure them in, but some people do have the ability to appear perfectly normal, desirable in fact, all while hiding who they truly are. And if you ever encounter a client that for some unknown reason just doesn't fit right with you, listen to your intuition. Human beings have relied on this intuition for millennia to keep them safe. So don't go through this uncomfortable relationship with this client that just doesn't feel right to you. Save yourself the the stress and possible future troubles and pass on the client. So those were the red flags I wanted to discuss with you today. Red flag number one, the client has a bad reputation. Two, inconsistent communication. Three, when they rudely challenge your fees. Four, when they expect you to be on call 24-7. Five, when they want to micromanage you. Six, a client that doesn't want to partake in the discovery process. Seven, a client that wants you to steal or copy from another designer. Eight, a client that complains about previous design work. Nine, a client who doesn't want to sign a contract. Ten, a client that wants you to work for free or for exposure, or on spec. 11, the client flirts with you. And 12, when you just have a bad feeling about the client. These are all great reasons for telling a client, sorry, you know, thank you very much for the opportunity, but I'm going to have to pass on this job. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning of this episode, next week, I'm going to share with you ways to actually tell the client that you're going to pass on their project or working with them. So I'll share you all that, how to go about doing that in next week's episode. 
But for this week, I just wanted to share those red flags, things that you should be looking out for. I've dealt with almost every one of these over the years. In my 13 years working for myself and in the previous time I spent working for the print shop, every one of these red flags I've spotted at some point in a client. And unfortunately, some of them were not enough or in the case when I was working at the print shop where I couldn't say no to a client when they came in. I've worked and had to endure and put up with some of these clients. And let me tell you, it is no fun. You do not want to have these clients. And that's one of the best things about working for yourself, whether you call yourself a freelancer, an entrepreneur, a business owner, whatever it is, when you are working for yourself, you have the ability, you have the prerogative to say no to a client. And I highly encourage you to do that if any of these red flags pop up. So I would love to know what red flags do you look out for in potential clients? Is there anything I missed here? Please leave me a comment for this episode by visiting resourcefuldesigner.com slash episode 133. Now this episode is already running a little bit long and I've got one more design I have to complete before the end of the day. So I'm going to skip this week's question of the week, but I do want to let you know that my mailbag is running very low. So if you have a question you would like me to answer on a future episode of the podcast, please visit resourcefuldesigner.com slash feedback and fill out my form there and submit your question and I'll try to answer it on a future episode. Now I will share this great iTunes review I got. This one came in in the USA from PC Weenies Cartoonist and it says, informative and engaging. I just discovered Mark's podcast two weeks ago, in fact, and I've been blown away by how articulate, informative and actionable Mark's tips are. I've learned so much from just listening to the last two podcasts, so much so I immediately subscribed. Thank you, Mark, for sharing your knowledge and experience with your listeners. It's greatly appreciated. Well, thank you very much for that lovely review. I absolutely love getting these things. They let me know that what I'm doing here with Resourceful Designer is worth my time and effort. Now, if you haven't left a review, it doesn't matter where you are in the world, you can visit resourcefuldesigner.com slash iTunes, and that'll redirect you to the Apple store in your part of the world where you can leave a review for the podcast. And I will get it because I've got a handy service called My Podcast Reviews that emails me whenever somebody leaves a review, no matter where it is in the world. So thank you very much for that great review. And speaking of enjoying the podcast, I just want to give a quick shout out to everybody who is supporting Resourceful Designer on Patreon. It means so much to me that you are willing to part with a little bit of your money even if it's just the, a cup of coffee, a dollar a month. It's a cheap cup of coffee that you're buying me every month, thanking me for putting out the podcast. So thank you to everybody who is supporting, whether it's $1, $5, $10, $25, whatever it is you're supporting per month, it is so appreciated. It means so much to me that you are, are willing to spend a little bit of your hard-earned money to help me out. Now, if you aren't already a Patreon member and you would like to support the show, please visit resourcefuldesigner.com slash Patreon, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N, and for as little as $1 a month, less than the cost of a cup of coffee, you can support the show as well. So that's it for this week's episode. Remember to check with your hosting provider to see if there is a limit to the e-nodes that you can have on your server, and be sure to check in next week with part two of this episode on how to turn clients away. Until then... I am Mark DeCote, wishing you all the best with your graphic design business, and as always, reminding you to stay creative. Thanks for listening to the Resourceful Designer Podcast at resourcefuldesigner.com.